Alleluia. Amen. Before we have our sins, let's just read to um, part of the scriptures and then we move from there. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17. Media, remember NKJV. Hallelujah. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. I told you this morning is morning of shouting. You know, Paul Joshua said that there are some um, scriptures you read, and then because, you know, there are corrections, and then, you know, you take it home, and then, then there are some scriptures you read. Kaya. <laughs> they are for jumping and they are for shouting. Amen. A lot of the scriptures we are going to be reading this morning, they are for shouting and for jumping. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Very popular scripture. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now I'll be um, speaking to us this afternoon about um, what I titled the big deal about righteousness. Hallelujah. It's a big deal. <laughs> so I, this is my usual manner I will build up, so you need to follow me so that you don't look struck, because um, if you lose the beginning, you might not get the import of the end of the message. Hallelujah. What is righteousness? Righteousness is the quality of being right with God. The quality of being right with God. Righteousness is the divine standard of perfection. The divine standard of perfection. We can say it another way. You know, it's often said that righteousness is the ability to stand before God without guilt or condemnation. Are you getting me now? To be right with God according to the standard, the divine standard, God's standard of perfection. That's the reason why I'm giving these definitions because you will, you know, understand very soon. All right. So if you look at that definition, you will know that no one can actually stand before God without guilt or condemnation. It's not possible. Why? Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So nobody has that standard by themselves. Amen. Hallelujah. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, God introduced man to a glimpse of righteousness by faith. And he did that in the beginning through a man known as Abraham. Amen. Romans chapter 4. Let's just quickly read from verse 1 to verse 3 and then we move. What then shall we say that Abraham our father had found according to the flesh? Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. For the first time, we see a dimension of believing God. Not doing something. Did you, did, you, did you get that? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But it was a glimpse. Because man couldn't enter the full dimension of this righteousness because the sin nature had not yet been dealt with. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Is somebody following me? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the second part, says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. God had to deal with sin and deal with the nature of sin. There was a problem in quotes. 
that God had to deal with. Hallelujah. So, enters the old covenant. In other words, God introduced the old covenant. And, um, you know, in some ways, or depending on what you are talking about, you can also call it the law. Now, the old covenant was in, was in a necessary precursor of the new covenant because that was the only way men will understand the legal framework of the death and resurrection of the Messiah. I'm going to tie everything together. Just follow me step by step. Amen? God had to first bring in the Old Testament. Now, let me paint a picture. Imagine before um, 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 Moses, before the law and all that, you know, somewhere maybe after Noah, God just brought somebody into the earth and that person says, I'm the Messiah. It will make sense. Do you understand? They had no framework to understand who Jesus was. So God had to, first of all, bring in the old covenant with all its ordinances to give them a legal framework to understand the death and resurrection of Jesus that will come after. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 and 5 says, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. There was a purpose for the law. Amen. Is somebody following me? There was a purpose for the Lord. It was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Next verse. But after faith has come, we are no longer a tutor. So before faith came, they were under the law. And the law was there to bring them to Christ. So under the old covenant, remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or atonement for sin. So under the old covenant, the blood of bulls and goats were commanded to be used as sacrifice for the atonement of sins every year. <coughs> Am I making sense? I actually don't have time. I would just have gone back to Leviticus and seen all this, you know. See, everything I'm teaching this morning is an abridged version. That's, that's the sad truth. There is no way I can teach this in, in two hours. So, please go back and study after. Start from Leviticus if you want to understand the full scope of what we are talking about here. Accord, you know, we're talking about um, atonement of sins under the old covenant by the blood of bulls and goats. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Let's see verse 1, then we'll jump to verse 6. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary. Verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing service, uh, services. That's the regular priest. Now, look at verse 7. Verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood. In other words, he carried the blood, you know, of the sacrifice they made, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. That was the ordinance in the old covenant. Are, are, we, are we following? However, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't offer a perpetual and eternal cleansing of sins. So they had to do it every time, do it every year. And the high priest will offer sacrifice for both his sin and the sins of the people. Because it was, I mean, it was a man and he sinned too. Hebrews chapter 10, let's see from verse 1 to 4. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Did you see that? 
They did that every year to atone for the sins. But the Bible is saying in Hebrews that even though they did that, it was not possible to make those who approached perfect. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Ask him. If it was possible that they would be perfect by the bulls of goats and, you know, and bulls, but the blood of bulls and goats, sorry, he's saying that means they don't need to be offering it every time. Say, for the worshippers once purified would have no more consciousness of sin. Don't let me jump ahead of myself. Hallelujah. Saying that if that was possible, then this would have happened. But, verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Verse 4. For, let's read it together. I want to go. It is not what? Possible. Hallelujah. For the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But it was atoning for them, you know, for the sins. Or, to put it in the New Testament um, version, it was remitting for the sins. Hallelujah. The word atonement in Hebrews um, is kippur. It means a compensation for an offense. It means to repay debt. Somebody is owing. Hmm? If I atone for your debt, I have paid for that debt. Are you following? Compensation for an offense. If you, if you offended the governor, and the governor said that your offense is that they will demolish your land according to the law. Atonement for that. Ah! The example I want to give, I'll jump ahead of myself. So let me hold it. Let me hold it. <laughs> let me hold it. Amen. So the, the New Testament version, you know, usually if you look at um, King James Version, look at remission in Old Testament, you won't see it. Amen. you see some few um, instances of atonement in New Testament, but remission is a Greek word, um, and that Greek word is, uh, means a cancellation of the penalty of a criminal offense. You see that it's similar. To set free or pardon from an offense. So when we, are, when we are talking about remission, actually, we are talking about redemption. Somebody say amen. amen. Re, somebody say redemption. Amen. To rescue upon payment of a ransom or a debt. So because the blood of bulls and goats could not, what? Take away sins. Now, next phase enters the New Testament. Are you following the progression now? You are following the progression. Very good. So, again, let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. This time around, we read from verse 11 to verse 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Next verse. Not with the blood of goats and calves. Please follow this scripture carefully. But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. The outward man, uh, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15. Ha! There is something to shout about. Oh. And for this reason. <laughs> hey! He is the mediator of the new covenant. Sha, ya, ya. Hallelujah. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. <laughs> he is 
is the mediator of the new covenant, talking about Jesus. So Jesus came to shed his own blood, spotless, able to take away and deal with sin. <laughs> Remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, let me put a context and, you know, an understanding to that. <laughs> Before somebody says that, uh, you know, somebody begs you, now go and shoot the person and say, is the shed. <laughs> now, this principle holds true within the context of covenant. Did you hear what I just said? Within the context of a covenant. It's the reason why marriage as a covenant is very powerful. Someone say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. I don't need to, I, I don't let me deviate. Within the context of a covenant. So what is a covenant? A covenant simply is an agreement between two people or two peoples, hope you understand English, that says that what you are, I am, what I am, you are, what is yours is mine, what is mine is yours. Simply put. Did you get that? A covenant is an agreement between two people or two peoples that says that what you are, I am, what I am, you are, what you have, I have, what I have, you have. Did, did you get what I just said? A covenant equalizes. There is something to shout about. Oh. <laughs> Some people, they've gone ahead of me. They know where I'm landing. So you understand why I sang that song now. <laughs> Am I making sense? So, remember the old covenant was a precursor. It was a tutor. It was, it, the old covenant was a shadow of the substance that is the New Testament. So in the old covenant, right, there was yes a covenant that was caught by blood, but that blood was not enough. So even though it did something, it took away sin, but it couldn't really equalize. I'm going somewhere. Please follow. Don't think what I did not say. Just follow me, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Jesus came. To cut the new covenant. You saw it that he is the mediator of the new covenant. This is where I'm going to use illustration. Some people say I like using illustration. It's so that we understand. Ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, according to scripture, we see, you know, and we have read that. Through the death of Jesus, we have been redeemed from the penalty of sin. Is that correct? Tell your neighbor, say, but there is more. Because to leave us at that level was good, but wasn't going to do the thing God really wanted to do. Because a redeemed man, though his sins had been forgiven, I've come down again, sorry. Though his sins had been forgiven, right? Still does not have control of sin. Did you get? So, God did something. In that process of Jesus' death and resurrection, where he shed his blood, God was doing something. Because of time, I would have just read, you know, the rest of Hebrews chapter 9, you was see some of the things I'm about to say. Now, remember, I'm trying to see whether I should explain a little more about covenant so that you understand what I'm about to say. But, but, but I really don't have the time. It will take me at least like five minutes. Hallelujah. La pasha kabali brele bo sa talaba. 
Let me move ahead. So God caught a covenant, not with you and I. You know why? We are not equal to God. We do not have anything to give. Remember, what is yours is mine. What is mine is yours. But we do not get anything to give. We don't get shishi. Someone say shishi. We don't get. So what did God do? This is where my illustration comes in. Minister Finn, uh, Minister Okiki, God bless you. Please, let's preach together. All right, quickly. You stay there. Minister Finn, come, come here. This is God. It's, it's like, it's like, uh, I like that one. He's not the devil. You don't know what I'm going to say. This is God. Looking at all of us, she has been plenty. He wanted to cut a covenant on, with us to make us have the kind of life that he has. But we had nothing to give. We, I mean, do you get what I'm saying? So what did God do? God sent his son to become man so that through the sacrifice of this sinless man. So what, how did God do it? When he went to the cross and shed his blood, Without the shedding of blood, so sin is taken care of. Abi, fantastic. And then he resurrected. Bible says he was resurrected for our justification. Now, please let me use you as a representative of man. This man, this is the whole of humanity. Just you, you get it. What God now did. This guy has, been, has now been redeemed. Why? Jesus has died. But if God just left him like this, Jesus will have to probably come again. Mm. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You didn't hear me. Yes, so what did God do? God located him in, the, in this guy. So God caught a covenant with himself. Ah, yeah, and located us in Christ. That is the mystery of if any man is in Christ. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all I see is Jesus. There is something to shout about. Oh. This is the big deal about righteousness. He met him who knew no sin. To become sin, that is, he took on the nature of sin. Haya. That through him, me, moi, become the righteousness of God. In him, you come out, you know, concern me. In him. <laughs> Did we get what, what, what I just illustrated? Somebody say in him. Amen. When you get home, take your um, Bible dictionary, your concordance, and check all the places where in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. If you come back next Sunday, the same way, Jesus didn't die. It's not possible. Because now you have an understanding of what those statements mean. When he says in Christ Jesus, he's talking about a peculiar set of people. Ah, yeah, yeah. These guys now have the life of God. That is why they have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, they can stand before God without guilt, without condemnation. They, not because of what they did. Now they can stand before God as though they never sinned. It now makes sense when the Bible says we should come before the throne of grace boldly and find grace to help in time of need. My question is this. Most likely, the person that is needy is probably not perfect. But how can that person come boldly? It's because that person is located here. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Am I making sense this afternoon? I'm almost done, though. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
God is good. God is good. So when the devil comes to you with all his gimmicks and all that, you know, you know what to say. I'm in Christ. So what is the implication of righteousness in our daily work? I'm landing. I always like to tie everything, you know, when I'm teaching to things that you can. There are many, there are many. So I'll just go through some and then we are done. The first thing is what I've already said. We are now right with God. Somebody say, I'm right with God. I am right with God. No condemnation. No guilt. Say there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation. Hallelujah. Do you know how important this is? Have you heard that the devil is the accuser of the brethren? He will keep accusing you for many things. The ones you did are the ones you do not do. But let me tell you the joker. This is what you don't understand. What Jesus did is a legal thing. So what? Ha. <laughs> hey. This is the court of law. The devil is the accuser. Brings me before God and says, that is God who is the judge of all. But you know the beautiful thing? Jesus is my advocate. You didn't, you didn't hear me? The Bible says it, it lives to continually make intercession. There is something to shout about. Oh. Hallelujah. There is nothing that the devil can bring against you that can stand. Why? The person that died for you and I is our advocate. So all he needs to do is show up in court and remind the devil the debt was paid. The pardon of sin. Haya. You didn't hear me. Hallelujah. So now we are right with God. Therefore, there is no more condemnation. There is no more guilt. Number two. It also means we have dominion over sin. Quickly, let's open Romans, 10, Romans 6 from verse 1. We'll just read it to some point and stop. Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Remember? Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, again, in Christ, just go and do your study, you know, were baptized into his death, verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be what? Yes. The second implication of righteousness is that you have control over sin. Don't tell me you don't. Hallelujah. You now have dominion over sin. You can say no. That's the difference between you and the unbeliever. Hallelujah. Because you have a new nature. So if as a man, I start backing now, you just think I'm joking, or after a wife, I keep backing, you think there's something wrong with me. It's not that you think I'm a dog. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. It is natural for a dog to back. But if a man starts backing, two things... In the beginning, you might think, maybe I'm joking. After a while, you say there is something wrong somewhere. But you won't say it's no more a man. Did you hear what I just said? So you are looking for a solution to that abnormality 
of that expression. Because why? God has already taken care of the sin nature. So now you know that if you are doing something that is not of God, that is sinful in nature, you know it's not your nature. So what we are looking at is to rectify. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Number three, it also means we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. I would have just jumped to the next point, but I put this as a different point so that the next point will make sense. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 to 6. Hallelujah. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit where? Together in the heavenly places in what? In Christ. You see, I'm not in Christ then. In Christ. Now, what is the implication of this? Next point. It's, the, the, the big deal about righteousness is that you have authority over the devil. You didn't hear me. I mean what I just said. Because that's what the scripture says. It means now you have authority over the devil. You can tell the devil get lost and he will get lost. He won't say, uh, who are you? Amen? Amen? You can tell the devil get lost for my life, for my business, for my career, for my family, and he will get lost. He doesn't have a choice. Ephesians 1, let's read 19 to 23, and I end. Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. And what is, this, this, this was Paul praying, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, next verse, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, next verse, far above what? And, 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 and. That is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. Do you see how far the authority in Christ goes? Next verse. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. See the, verse 23. Which is his body? The fullness of him that fills all in all. Hallelujah. Is somebody righteous here this morning? If you have received the life of Jesus into your life, you are righteous. Say, I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, there is no more condemnation. Because I believe in the sacrifice of Jesus. I'm a new creation. I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can we stand up our feet? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the confidence that we have. Hallelujah. Listen, the, the, the import of this righteousness, though it has a great um, um, importance in this physical world, please do not make the mistake to think that all what Jesus did is so that whatever you become on this earth and then it ends there. There is much more. There is much more. But it's not for today. Hallelujah. No time. Amen. There is much more. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the adoration. Hello, thank you for watching us. We don't want this to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You know, um, after listening to God's word like this and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's an opportunity to come to him and it's a simple process because he has made all things available. I want to employ you now to give your heart to Christ and by saying these words, because giving your heart to Christ must be done consciously, he has paid the price. Say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you shed your blood for my justification. I accept your finished work right now, and I confess that you are the Lord of my life. 
I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have said those words, you are actually born again, a new creation in Christ. Join us for more of this. God bless you.